Excellent. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is my first international travel since COVID started several years ago, so it's very nice to be somewhere new and different. Um, so I just want to start by saying um, a big thank you to Bama, and I think he's still in the other room, for really organizing this workshop and for inviting us to come and present this work today. Um, my name is Beth LaCroix. I'm a technical advisor at PSI, Population Services International. We are an international nonprofit um, that works primarily in the global health arena. We work across family planning, HIV, malaria, some non-communicable disease areas as well. Our background is as a social marketing organization, but we have over the last decade and more recently as well, really been looking at um, the contributions we can make to the health system and to improving the market for different health products and services. Um, so my work focuses primarily on developing metrics to measure the effectiveness and scale of our strategy and modeling the impact of our work. Um, today, I'm excited to finally present the review of um, demand forecasting for new and also lesser used contraceptive technologies and our set of recommendations for them. Um, this work has been funded through USAID with the ECO project, as well as through the LEAP initiative through the Gates Foundation. Um, I'll start off today with a little bit of background, um, some of our objectives, the methods we use for this review, and we'll spend some more time digging into the results um, and discussing the key recommendations that come out of this, and we'll plan to have a few moments at the end for Q&A. So let's dive in. In low and middle income countries, um, an estimated 218 million men have an unmet need for contraception. What this means is that there's 218 million women who do not want to have a child within the next two years or possibly ever, but for some reason are not using a modern method of contraception such as condoms, injectables, implants, oral pills, um, IUDs, et cetera. When asked why they're not using a modern method, the most common answers are because um, one, health concerns, um, concerns about the health risks, fears of unwanted side effects, and concerns about unwanted changes to the menstrual cycle, either shortening or lengthening, and also infrequent sex. New contraceptive methods are really exciting. These new technologies have the potential to um, increase modern contraceptive use globally and also improve the client experience, um, particularly for those women who would choose a modern method if the profile better fit their desires, such as had different side effects or side effects that they were less worried about, or for an on-demand method, or rather than one requiring continuous use, especially for those who have infrequent sex. Um, in order to get these new contraceptive technologies to market, we rely heavily on market size estimates and demand forecasts to inform major decisions around development and introduction. Um, from early research and development, we're looking at what sorts of products should be invested in, um, all the way through to procurement and plans for launching a new product in country. Of course, accurate forecasting helps inform this better decision making, reducing oversupply or undersupply, particularly in areas here where there's already limited resources um, that we need to use them efficiently. Um, and again, just bringing this back to the ultimate impact is procuring too many of a method and we have money that was wasted that could have been better spent on other, in other areas and other health areas. Um, if we procure too little, we have women who will end up going without this product that they need. Best case scenario, they use a different product that they're mostly fine with. Worst case scenario, we have unwanted, you know, unintended pregnancies and different fertility outcomes. So, of course, there are challenges to forecasting for these new methods because we have no historical data to pull from for these. These are brand new, coming to the market, or still in development. Um, and there's little published guidance on this topic. The guidance that does exist is a great guide that was put out by the Reproductive Health Supply Coalition back in 2012 that was looking at um, demand forecasting for new contraceptive technologies. However, this guide focused primarily on demand for immediate procurement decisions. We wanted to build upon this and update this. In the last decade, as Layla noted, we've had a number of new contraceptive technologies we've been able to learn a lot of lessons from, including the contraceptive implant work that she discussed already. 
And so we wanted to really build these lessons in from contraceptive implants, the hormonal IUDs, as well as subcutaneous um, self-injection and including, um, yeah, subcutaneous injectables, including self-injection. So we wanted to really update this recommendation and take a broader approach to this to consider those products that are still early in development or have not yet been introduced at scale. So our goal with this um, project is to support forecast-based decision-making and accurate data integration for new contraceptive technologies with the global health community. So we've gone through, we've um, attended to examine and describe the different methods, assumptions, and purposes of some of these common forecasting approaches, and ultimately pull together a set of best practices and recommendations for the community of practice. We started with a landscape review of the peer-reviewed and gray literature. Um, we used this review to pull together um, a conceptual framework and to clarify some of these key terms. Um, this conceptual framework we'll see in the results is what we use to develop into a key informant interview guide. The bulk of our results come from 29 key informant interviews um, that we did with experts in the area of market estimation and demand forecasting, particularly for these new contraceptive technologies, um, including Layla, thank you for joining in on that, Baman as well as one of our interviewees. So we do have um, some people here in the room who joined in on that. Um, and our experts, we tried to take a broad look at experts and include those who are both producers of forecasts as well as consumers of forecasts uh, to get this broad range of experiences. Our experts represented also donors, manufacturers, institutional buyers, um, a Ministry of Health official, as well as technical assistance providers. Ultimately, we took notes from each of these reviews, we coded them, did a qualitative thematic content analysis to pull out those highlights and insights and key lessons learned, which we've developed into our key recommendations, as well as a um, manuscript that we are ready to about to submit for publication as well. So here is an overview of our key informant findings. Uh, this first piece is really our conceptual framework of the purposes of different forecasts. Across the um, life cycle of a product, forecasts involve inform many, many different decisions. Um, at the top of this, you'll see the product stage from early and late research and development um, in the middle to products that exist but haven't been introduced or are not yet introduced at scale. And over to the right products that are already at scale in a market. Our primary users in the pink box um, represent product developers, manufacturers, donors, institutional buyers, implementers, um, generally following that stage of the product up there, but knowing that there's some overlap between those. And then we get down into the three white boxes here, which really gets into what kinds of decisions are informed at each product stage. So at the left, when we're looking at early research and late research and development, the kinds of decisions we're looking at involve um, developing new products that are responsive to consumer needs. Um, this is advocating for investments, um, investing in actual product development, and making trade-off decisions within a portfolio. These forecasts tend to be fairly long-term, looking years and in some cases decades uh, into the future. In the middle, when we're looking at products that have yet to be introduced um, or yet to be introduced at scale. Um, here, we also have some decisions around advocacy and investments and also planning um, for country prioritization, necessary regulatory steps, um, market shaping interventions such as access pricing, and of course, actual national product introduction plans. These forecasts tend to have a more mid-range time horizon on the scale of one to several years. And finally, on the right, um, forecasts to inform supply planning and distribution, um, as well as production planning for manufacturers. This is mostly applicable to products already at scale in a market, but can also be applied to products that now exist and are ready to be more broadly introduced at scale. These type of forecasts tend to be shorter term. Um, they can be as short term as quarterly or every few months, um, or up through you know, a year, or as Layla mentioned for the implants, up to around 18 months. 
uh, next piece was really starting to look at what different kinds of inputs we find in these forecasts. Um, again, looking at R&D decisions on the left, um, introduction planning and market shaping work in the middle and production and supply planning on the right for the purposes. We really, across all of these, one of our main pieces of information comes from consumer research. This is looking at how do we know what women are going to switch to this new method? And how do we get that data and information? Ideally, we are conducting actual research on this. We are doing target product profile exposure. We could be looking at a simulated test market. We are doing discrete choice experiments. Um, we are out there collecting this data ourselves. We're not always able to do this. We can also get some of this information from large scale surveys, such as demographic and health surveys um, and PMA surveys. These can provide some of this information. The disadvantage is that we're not in control of what questions are actually asked or how they're asked. And if this is going to actually, if, if this information is actually going to benefit us. Um, and finally, we can sometimes pull information from focus groups, um, clinical trials and small pilot programs as well. This gets us to the estimated conversion rate, which is essentially what percentage of women say they would uptake this new method. Um, we combine this with demographic and health data to actually get an estimate number of women. Our demographic data traditionally comes from censuses or um, annual population projections. And we also look at this over time. So we are looking at population growth each year and in, um, include that in these projections to take that into account. So the bottom two boxes here, we have um, two additional approaches that are often developed in tandem to this kind of consumer-based approach. The first is using historical product, um, consumption data from a proxy product or a proxy market. Again, it's a new product. We don't have historical data to pull from this. Um, but what we can do is pick a product that is similar um, in terms of type of product in terms of value proposition and pull this, use the data from this product um, as our historical data. For example, this could be looking at use of the copper IUD when estimating demand for a hormonal IUD method um, or looking at the introduction of a product in Benin when we wanna predict uptake in Togo. So a word of caution, selecting a good proxy product has its own set of best practices and can dramatically affect your forecast. Um, we'll get into that in the next slide as well. And finally at the bottom piece is considering the uh, specific constraints and opportunities um, in your market where you're looking to introduce this. Um, this can include looking at capacity for service delivery. You know, how many can providers actually deliver this service? What does that look like? Are there enough providers? Are there enough um, um, health posts to be providing this? Um, as well as considering funding for a national program. Is there going to be consistent funding? Is there going to be a push in funding to get this out to have this supported? Um, this piece really often serves as a reality check uh, to the original forecast. Pulling these three together, there's obviously differences between them and they can be fairly dramatic. Um, in these cases, we do recommend sitting down with um, experts in these areas to fully understand where the differences are coming from and to really help reconcile all these differences. So selecting prox proxy products, um, our key informants really highlighted the importance of choosing an appropriate proxy product. Um, a good product should be similar in terms of the value proposition for the consumer. Uh, it should be similar in terms of channel of access. Is this something that is self-administered? Is, does you need to go to a health clinic to receive it? Can you purchase it at a pharmacy? Um, price point, of course, is very important, as well as frequency of use of the product. Um, for example, a uh, five-year IUD would not necessarily be a great proxy product for an on-demand contraceptive pill. Um, in addition, pilot studies and consumer research can help inform what we select as a proxy product. Um, pilot studies, we can look at what methods early adopters actually switched from. So did most women in the pilot study switch from say a provider administered injectable to a new self-administered injectable? If so, this indicates this is probably a good proxy product for us to use. Consumer research can also be really helpful for this. Um, if we can actually ask women, which of these methods are you most interested in? And we can look and see, do emergency contraceptive users report the most interest in using an on-demand contraceptive pill? 
great, this could be a good proxy product for this as well. And finally, it's really important to look at how the uptake of this proxy product has changed over time. Um, with new methods of contraception, uptake always tends to follow an S-curve. We see a slow initial uptake, a surge in growth, and ultimately a plateau. And it can be very tempting to take that high growth rate of a long established product and apply that to this new product on the market that we're looking at. Um, but it's important to look at the growth curves of when that proxy product was introduced, not where it's currently at. So to talk a little bit through some of the different outputs um, that we see, these obviously vary greatly among forecast purposes. Um, common ones we see are, as far as output units, are users or potential users of the product, units procured or units consumed, um, monetary value, return on investment, um, can vary depending on the forecast consumer. One note is our key informants noted that it is difficult to translate well between users and units of a product. We have conversions to do this, but they are problematic and it is very hard to do this well. So keep that in mind when developing a forecast, determine this at the get-go because it's not a good practice to convert at the end. Uh, the type of output can also vary quite a bit. We have seen single point estimates or line estimates that may or may not have confidence intervals around them. Um, we also commonly see estimates for different scenarios, such as a conservative, middle of the road, or ambitious uptake scenarios. Um, we've even seen a rating system with a red, yellow, green stoplight for how promising a new method of contraception may be. Um, we also see things as looking at the relative market share, um, using stochastic simulations, and looking at the break-even point as well. And to note with any output type, it is how important it is to acknowledge uncertainty, but also to avoid implying false precision. With these new methods, we rely on a lot of assumptions and we don't necessarily have good data to back this up. So while we can put in a confidence interval around that, the data that goes into that confidence interval, we can really, um, can really imply some false precision around that. So it's really important to balance that in these kinds of forecasts. As we noted earlier, Time periods can vary from as short as a few months to 20 plus years down the road. They may represent a single point in time or growth over time. Um, importantly here is looking at um, forecasts for a single contraceptive method versus the entire method mix. Um, particularly for decisions around funding prioritization, it's really important to consider this method in the context of all other available contraceptive methods. This helps us account for market cannibalization, where users might switch from an existing method to this new method. This isn't necessarily bad. They might prefer the new method. It might be more effective. It may have fewer side effects. But ultimately, it's not increasing the number of new users, and we're ultimately not decreasing that unmet need for contraception. And finally, uh, disaggregations we often use to look at particular geographies of interest or in some cases market segments, um, as well as possibly the channel or mode of use, whether it's through the public or private sector or a self-administrated um, self um, form of contraception. So overall, our, the key insights from our um, key informant interviews fell into three main categories. One is in selecting the approach. The, probably the biggest piece of advice is choosing a model that is fit for purpose and the importance of that, which does not always happen in these spaces um, and in the demand forecasting community for our contraceptive use. So decide upon this purpose early on, involve stakeholders, and in, um, clearly communicate this use. Everything else, all your outputs, all your inputs, all your assumptions, all cascades down from this. Um, and select your approach based on this purpose, but also keeping in mind resource constraints. In an ideal world, we would be able to be doing consumer research, all the consumer research we want to pull this information in. That's not the world we live in. And so figuring out how to balance that to get the best available data and forecast is important. Um, when conducting the forecast or market estimate, um, again, consider method switching and the effects on the broader method mix. So, as mentioned, are women switching from an existing method, or is this women who are not using a method who are taking up this new method? Um, it's important to consider that and the effect that this new method will ultimately have on the method mix in a country. 
Um, secondly, is um, looking at, again, the constraints and opportunities to reality test this forecast. Even if there's high demand for this product, can the health system keep up? Um, are there enough providers? Is there steady funding? And this becomes even more important later on um, in the product life cycle when this forecast feeds into a supply plan. And finally, results, one is clearly articulate assumptions, um, acknowledge uncertainty in the forecast. And this last one, which I think usually gets forgotten, is refresh the forecast once you know if your assumptions were correct. Um, we're often funded to do this work to develop a market size estimate or a demand forecast. And we do that and it gets handed off and that's the last that we see of it. And so ensuring that we can go back and do that, whether that's writing this into proposals that we have, um, really ensuring that we can go back and update that with our corrected assumptions and the new data that's available to us is important. So these results we've com um, really compiled into a few key recommendations. The first is developing a shared vocabulary. Through our literature review and our key informant interviews, we notice that there's fairly inconsistent terminology use um, when discussing market sizing and demand forecasting. Forecasting is often used as an umbrella term to encompass market sizing, demand forecasting, quantification activities. I also fall prey to this and I have probably several times in this presentation already. It's um, just really ingrained. Um, so to help clarify, we really propose consistent use of some of these following definitions to avoid misinterpretation and misusing the results of forecasts. Market sizing to refer to estimating number of potential users, and this typically happens early in the product life cycle. Um, demand forecasting to happen a little more mid-life cycle to estimate the quantities of products that would be needed in a given time frame for a given population or geography. Um, supply planning or quantification, which tends to happen again for products already at scale. Um, and this is really looking at for calculating the quantities required to fulfill the supply line. Um, this is based on demand forecast, but includes a number of other considerations such as funding availability. The last two pieces, again, are conversion rate, which I mentioned before, or uptake rate. And this is the estimated number of women who would who would either switch to or start using this new product, uh, this new method. And this is the key piece of information that we need to develop these forecasts as well. And finally, referring to proxy or analog products um, that have historical consumption or procurement data and share those key characteristics with our product of interest. Second, we recommend following a deceivingly very simple decision pathway that also I think often gets neglected in the rush to um, develop these estimates. Um, our KIs again really emphasized choosing a model that is fit for purpose for the intended forecast consumer. And so this means really sitting down and step one is working with all the stakeholders involved. Determine what is the goal of the forecast? What specific decisions are going to be informed by this exercise? Um, deciding whether to invest in the development of a new product requires a very different approach than creating a national introduction plan for a method. Um, everything else cascades down from this, so it's important to get this first step right. Um, second is deciding on the necessary output types to make the decision you just came up with. Again, keeping in mind that it's very difficult to convert between um, product units and users at the end. So determining this outright um, is really important to avoid misusing um, a forecast. And of course, also accounting for uncertainty around these outputs. Consider a range of uncertainty and how that will um, impact the forecast decisions. Many of our key informants recommended creating an average estimate with both best and worst case scenarios around that. And of course, clearly articulating the assumptions for each of those scenarios. Um, and finally, then the step three is determining what inputs and assumptions you need to get to those outputs. Clearly lay these out. Um, again, keeping in mind resource constraints. We don't have the time and money to do all the consumer resource that, uh, research that we want. So what data is available? What's the best available data for us to use? Um, assumptions, again, should be clearly articulated based on the best available data and including expert knowledge. Um, we recommend getting stakeholder buy-in to these assumptions. Um, if there's not stakeholder buy-in, a change, a simple change to the one assumption can dramatically affect the results of the forecast, of course. Um, and also, we really recommend documenting these and whenever possible, making them publicly available with the forecast. 
And finally, avoiding common pitfalls that um, came up is very common. Um, in many cases, our demand forecasts tend to overestimate um, market sizing or demand forecasting, which can lead to poor use of limited resources. I think the um, Layla's interesting case um, of the implants is kind of runs counter to that. It's one of the few cases we've seen where they're not quite meeting demand. So it's important to account for overstatements in consumer research, um, perhaps by weighting survey responses, by the likelihood of method uptake, or looking at consumer satisfaction with their current method, um, accounting for method discontinuation. We don't have discontinuation for a method that is new to the market. Um, can we look at a proxy product for that? Um, what would be an appropriate, um, appropriate product to look at the discontinuation rates for? And should we discount consumer self-report? And finally, not considering uptake in the context of the entire method mix. Um, again, it's important to present the full method mix when looking at potential uptake of a new method. Um, a final word, quick word of warning is using pre-existing forecasts. Previously developed forecasts uh, can provide valuable information and reference points, but using a model that is not fit for purpose can lead to inaccurate decision-making. And we've seen this in action when, um, one of our key informants noted we've had volume guarantees that were negotiated based on consumption-driven forecasts. Then ultimately, countries did not order the planned number of products because it was consumption-driven and not procurement-driven, um, which led to concerns and issues. Um, so we do caution against using estimates from existing forecasts without really closely examining their initial intent and underlying assumptions. So we've made huge progress in the last decade um, in developing methods for demand forecasting for our new methods with contraceptive implants, new injectables and hormonal IUDs. We have many common issues around overestimating demand and using forecasts in um, maybe not ideal ways, but these can be really easily avoided. And finally, the exciting piece is we have lots of opportunities to continue to apply this. We have multi-purpose technologies such as the dual prevention pill for both HIV and pregnancy prevention. Um, we're looking at on-demand oral contraceptive pills. We are looking at incorporating digital technology such as fertility tracking apps um, and many other opportunities. There's hypothetical um, contraceptive tape. We have a possible uh, month-long pill or a year-length vaginal ring. So we have many opportunities to continue to apply these and to learn additional lessons. So just a quick thank you to all of our um, expert key informants who spent their time to talk to us about this and share their knowledge, um, as well as to the rest of our team on this, Ashley Jackson, Seth McGovern, Kate Rademacher, and Claire Rothschild, who were not able to join today, um, but were integral in this work. And I think I have a minute or two for questions still, so thank you. Yes, so yeah, so what we really run into is difficulty in looking at what consumers, you know, we use a lot of consumer research, so, you know, we can look at, it's easy to estimate how many potential users based on what women say in our consumer research, but then actually getting to say how many products need to be ordered. Are women going to use this product continuously throughout the year? Um, are there small breaks in discontinuation? Because even, um, you know, days between refills or skipped doses can add up to 
you know, essentially a month of missed coverage over the course of a year and for one woman. And then when scaled up to a, you know, country population based forecast that can have a fairly dramatic effect. Um, um, we do have a conversion method in family planning, CYP, couple years of protection, which essentially looks at how many years of protection provide. And this is five year IUD tends to provide around 4.6 years of protection. This takes into account discontinuation and um, unintended pregnancies with that. Um, and this is often used as a proxy measure, or this is the measure we often use when converting, but it's not perfect. It's difficult and it's problematic. And that still gets us to a potential number of products that a woman might need. And then of course, on top of that is looking at, you know, what's considering stockouts, considering the supply chain, um, considering, you know, how far ahead these need to be manufactured and procured, um, considering issues around funding, will they be available? Um, so it really, there's a lot of pieces that go into it and it's, it can be done very easily, but it's not a particularly accurate way to do it. Yes, exactly. Any other questions? Thank you.